In the process, they have revealed a marvel of engineering on a miniaturized scale. Howard Berg at Harvard has labeled it the most efficient machine in the universe. These machines, some of them are running at 100,000 RPMs and are hardwired into a signal transduction or sensory mechanism so that it's getting feedback from the environment. And even though they're spinning that fast, they can stop on a dime. It only takes a quarter turn for them to stop and shift directions and start spinning 100,000 RPM in the other direction. And just like outboard motors on motorboats, it has a large number of parts which are necessary for the motor to work. The bacterial flagellum, two gears, forward and reverse, water-cooled, proton motive force, it has a stator, it has a rotor, it has a U-joint, it has a drive shaft, it has a propeller, and they function um, as these parts of machines. It's, you know, it's not convenient that we give them these names. That's truly their function. Since its discovery, scientists have tried to understand how a rotary motor could have arisen through natural selection. As yet, they have failed to offer any detailed Darwinian explanation. To see why, we must understand a feature of molecular machines known as irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity was coined by Mike Behe in describing these molecular machines. Basically what it says is that you have multi-component parts to any given organelle or system in a cell, all of which are necessary for function. That is, if you remove one part, you lose function of that system. Irreducible complexity also applies to biological machines, including the bacterial flagellar motor. All told, there are about 40 different protein parts which are necessary for this machine to work. And if any of those parts are missing, uh, then either you get a flagellum that doesn't work because it's missing the hook or it's missing the drive shaft or whatever, or it doesn't even get built. You build this structure from the inside out. You are counting the number of, of components in a ring structure or the stator, and once that's assembled, there's feedback that says, okay, no more of that component now, a rod is added. A ring is added, another rod is added, the U-joint is added. Once the U-joint is at a certain size and a certain degree of, of bend, about a quarter turn, that's shut off and then you start adding components for the propeller. These are all made in a precise sequence, just like you would build a building. To build a motor correctly requires a complex system of machines that coordinate the timing of the assembly instructions. But how could natural selection construct such a system? The co-option argument doesn't explain this. You see, in order to construct that flagellar mechanism or tens of thousands of other such mechanisms in the cell, you require other machines to regulate the assembly of these structures. And those machines themselves require machines for their assembly. If even one of these pieces is missing or put in the wrong place, your motor isn't going to work. So this apparatus to assemble the flagellar motor is itself irreducibly complex. In fact, what we have here is irreducible complexity all the way down. We know a lot about the bacterial flagellum. We still have a lot to learn, but we know a lot about it and uh, there's no explanation for how this complex molecular machine was ever produced by a Darwinian mechanism. 150 years ago, scientists did not know about irreducibly complex molecular machines. Yet Charles Darwin anticipated the difficulty that systems such as these could pose to his theory. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Uh, I know dozens of mathematicians who scratch their head and say, you guys think this is the way life originated? It's 
absolutely a preposterous theory. And many, many very significant figures, John von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, just laughed at Darwinian theory. He hooted at it. Uh, so it's, it's perfectly absurd. This is a point in a polemical dispute. It's not a, a reasonable um, standard of criticism. Opposition to Darwinian theory is, I wouldn't say widespread, but there's a consistent group of people among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists who simply don't, uh, don't accept it, don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. In the years since Kenyon's rejection of chemical evolution, science has revealed the details of an entire system of information processing that bears the hallmarks of intelligent design. With computer animation, we can enter the cell to view this remarkable system at work. After entering the heart of the cell, we see the tightly wound strands of DNA, storehouses for the instructions necessary to build every protein in an organism. In a process known as transcription, a molecular machine first unwinds a section of the DNA helix to expose the genetic instructions needed to assemble a specific protein molecule. Another machine then copies these instructions to form a molecule known as messenger RNA. When transcription is complete, the slender RNA strand carries the genetic information through the nuclear pore complex, the gatekeeper for traffic in and out of the cell nucleus. The messenger RNA strand is directed to a two-part molecular factory called a ribosome. After attaching itself securely, the process of translation begins. Inside the ribosome, a molecular assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids. These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell and then linked into chains often hundreds of units long. Their sequential arrangement determines the type of protein manufactured. When the chain is finished, it is moved from the ribosome to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape critical to its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is then released and shepherded by another molecular machine to the exact location where it is needed. This is absolutely mind-boggling to perceive at this scale of size such a uh, finely tuned um, apparatus, a device that, uh, that bears the marks of intelligent design and manufacture. And we have the details of an immensely complex molecular realm of genetic information processing. And it's exactly this new realm of molecular genetics where we see the most compelling evidence of design on the Earth.